and has impact the region fish production from marine capture and aquaculture. Fishing operations at sea had encountered difficulties due to the national lockdown measures in many countries, uh, including our region, that prohibit fishers from going out to fishing at sea. Uh, for your information, day one, uh, let me show you the screen. Uh, Our day one, we have, uh, we will present you views and experience from our cooperating international and regional fisheries agency. We have invited uh, three honors guest speakers representing FAO headquarters for today. Uh, FAO headquarters, uh, Mr. Masio, the senior of fishery senior fishery officer at FAO for trade issues. And the second speaker of today, we have the representative from uh, InfoFish, Mr. Api. And our last but not least speaker of today is the representative from the World Fish Center, Dr. Mike Philip. Before entering to the speaker, I will give you a bit more information of the uh, background. On the day two, we have the issues more comprehensive and specific on the impact of the national lockdown on seafood supply chain and mitigation of the impact. We have totally six persons, a resource person on day two tomorrow. We will hear the comprehensive report and information on the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the major commodity of uh, capture fisheries and aquaculture from key exporters of fish and main champion of the fish production exporter from our region. Such views from the private sector that may have their business long-term uh, consequences to the impact from the COVID-19 that would also be shared to our audience for tomorrow by our special invited speaker from the first one, Mr. Narin from the Thai Union Company. And we have Mr. Anusha from uh, Adaman Surimi company, and we have a researcher from SafeDeck training department, Mr. Isla, to share the research on the impact of the COVID-19 for the fishing operations of small scale fishers in case of Thailand. And the other speakers for tomorrow, including the, the, the Mr. Dr. Panit Suwan is the director of Park Food and president of the Thai Frozen Food Association. And also we have the representative from the Vietnam Association of Seafood Exporters and producer, uh, Deputy General of Secretary, Madame Lan. And lastly, we have special guest, uh, Mr. Bandit. He is the chief of the Vessel Monitoring System Group of the Department of Fisheries Thailand. He will present us the, the difficulties in terms of uh, managing the activities to monitor uh, fishing operation at sea of the commercial fishing vessels in case of Thailand. That is the, the main speakers of today and tomorrow that I, I will introduce them more a bit information when, before we enter into his or her presentation. And by now, I would like to invite uh, our Secretary General, Madame Malini Sumitwiti, to uh, give you a welcome remark, please. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of CFD, I would like to welcome everyone to the CEPTEC webinar on the impacts of COVID-19 on fisheries and aquaculture in Southeast Asia. Thank you very much for joining us. As we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has knocked down all sector across the globe and the fisheries sector has not been spared. In Southeast Asia, where fisheries industries contribute significantly to the economy and well-being of the people, the sector had been very much affected. 
The measures imposed by the governments to control the spread of the virus, such as locking down of countries and closures of public services and transportation, has worsened the economic situation of the region. At this moment, we do not have a single clue when this will stop and things will be able to return to normal. CFTEC therefore conducts this webinar to create a platform to share information and experiences on impacts of COVID-19 on the fisheries sector, which enable us to gain better understanding of the current situation and establish adaptation measures to the new normal for our future. Lastly, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all the speakers for your contribution during this difficult time. Ladies and gentlemen, without taking too much of your time, I welcome you all to this CFDEC webinar. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, uh, thank you very much, Madam Secretary General. First, I'd like to, before entering into the first presenter, I would like to give you a bit background on, on uh, our first speaker, Mr. Marcio Castro de Sosa. He is a senior fishery officer of for trade issues of the FAO headquarters in Rome. He's also served as the secretary of the FAO subcommittee on fish trade. Uh, that is the main global forum for consultations among countries, including technical and economic aspects of the international trade of fish and fishery products in the world. And we are presenting you, he is the also coordinator for the GlowFish, where the specific FAO unit responsible for information and analysis of the international fish trade and markets. He has implemented a number of projects and analysis and policy orientation on topics related to trade. And of course, he very keen on the international fish trade and in fishery of uh, FAO. He also responsible for development of fisheries uh, training in the area of fish uh, trade and regulations. I would like to, to entertain you, the, our first presenter, Mr. Masio, please. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you uh, on behalf of FAO for the invitation to participate in this CIFDEC event. I'd like to really to, to thank CIFDEC, those initiatives during this, this uh, situation that we face are quite important. And uh, 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 I would just would like, before starting my presentation, just to summarize that from, from a global perspective, what I'm trying, uh, what we are trying to do here is to present the current situation in fisheries in terms of production and trade, because that explains a lot of the impacts that we are facing with COVID-19. So my presentation is basically divided into two parts. The first one is at the global setting of production and trade of fish and fish products. And the second one, it is specific, is a specific one related to COVID-19. Of course, both of them, since uh, it's an FAO perspective, it's going to be presented from a global perspective. Of course, we know that during uh, the other presentations, particularly tomorrow, uh, we are going to enter into more details about uh, specific regional aspects. Uh, I hope that uh, everybody is seeing my screen now. Uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, the numbers that I'm going to present here, about uh, three weeks ago, FAO has just uh, released uh, a publication that we release every two years, which is called SOFIA. It, it presents an overview of statistics on production trade and general trends in both fisheries and aquaculture. So many of the numbers that I'm going to present here, they have just been released in SOFIA. And if you want to download this publication, you can use this QR code here. Uh, 
This is a very traditional graph that FAO uses in many of its presentations. And this graph shows clearly the importance of aquaculture in the last years. So aquaculture is growing very fast. That's the blue area here in the, area in the last years. And uh, white capture is relatively stable in the last, the last years. So this is an important trend, the, the, the growing importance of aquaculture. So this is a, a very important trend that has a direct impact on what, what, what the situations we are seeing today uh, due to the COVID-19. Uh, when you see that, uh, that uh, yellow, that orange line of white capture relatively stable, it's because we do have a problem in many regions of the world with the status of the resources. So uh, this uh, area here in orange shows that around, uh, that, that area here shows the biological unsustainable stocks at the global level. So the green area here is sustainable stocks and the orange area here is unsustainable stocks. So we see a, 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 a increase, a, a slow increase in the biological unsustainable stocks at the global level. However, when you look at the global level, the situation varies a lot according to the region. So here again, we have in orange what is unsustainable and in green, bluish, what is sustainable. So you see many areas of the world that are performing quite well in terms of stock management. They have very, a, a, very, a very high proportion of their stocks uh, under sustainability limits, under sustainable limits. So this is quite remarkable. So we cannot uh, take that information at the global level because the situation regionally varies a lot. And when you look at the main producers uh, at the international level, we see clearly a predominance of uh, uh, Asian countries. That's, that's quite, that's quite uh, uh, obvious, both in terms of white capture, but also in terms of aquaculture production. So there is a predominance of uh, uh, Asian countries. In capture, we have China, Indonesia, Vietnam, India. Uh, of course, uh, ma many of those countries with some specific species as their highlight products. Uh, in aquaculture, you have India, Indonesia, Vietnam. So there are many Asian pro uh, countries that has a prominent role in terms of uh, uh, producers in both capture and aquaculture. And uh, one important issue is that uh, we have seen many aspects of uh, what happened during the COVID-19 time. And one important, uh, one particular issue about fish is that fish is a very important uh, particular, uh, is a very important particular commodity because it has a very international pattern. We have to be very conscious about that. So when you look at the international trade of fish and fish products, we have to be aware that the sum of all products traded in value terms for fish is equivalent to the sum of beef, pork, and poultry. So we are talking about a very important international commodity. And with all the restrictions that we had during the COVID-19, including border restrictions, including transportation, that has a huge impact on this kind of, of commodity that has a direct link with international trade. And when you look at uh, the trade flow, it's amazing. 
because it's a completely different pattern that we have for fish in comparison with other commodities. Why is that? There is a big reason for that. Because if you look at, uh, at, uh, at, at uh, poultry, if you look at cattle, you do not have the variety of species that we have for fish and fish products. For fish and fish products, we do have a considerable variety of species if, if comparison to other. So it's even for big producers of fish and fish products, it's completely impossible for them to supply the, the national demand for fish and fish products. So even big producers, they also import a lot. So we have Spain here, you have China. So this arrow, the thick the arrow, it shows the, the bigger, the trade flow, and of course, the point of the arrow show the, the, the direction of the flow. So uh, fish has this nuance of having a very dynamic international pattern. Then what are the main exporters and importers? If you look at the main exporters, you have China, Norway, and a lot of also a lot of Asian countries, Vietnam, India, Denmark, Thailand, Canada, the Netherlands. Of course, the Netherlands is more associated with the uh, Rotterdam effect of re-exports. Uh, in terms of the imports, we also have uh, China, and also we have big producers, Spain, Italy, UK, France, Japan. So uh, also big producers are also big importers of fish products. That's a very unique aspect, as I mentioned before. And what are the main international trade products? You see a predominance of salmon, but very close associated with shrimps and prawns. So shrimps, prawns, salmon, trouts, and smelts make a big component of this international trade of fish and fish products. Then you have tunas, tuna-like products, and species, pods, and squids, and octopus and cuttlefishes. So this is a generic a global analysis of what are the main species that we have internationally traded. I'm going to dive now a little bit of the, of the, the issue with the COVID-19. First of all, I would like to raise some, some, uh, some issues with you in terms of uh, that the situation is changing very fast. So we might have problems in terms of presenting data that tomorrow is not going to be the same. And of course, we, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, I'm presenting here from a global perspective. So there are big regional differences too that, uh, of course, many of those are going to be addressed in more detail tomorrow. But uh, let me try to come up with some, some specific issues that are common in the, at the global level. Uh, in the first part of the presentation, I mentioned the complexity of fisheries. And this complexity of fisheries has a direct impact on what, what are the results or the effects of the COVID-19 on fisheries. We have, in opposition to other animal proteins, we can have two different origins. The fish can be white capture or the fish can be farmed. Uh, we have a very important supply from developing countries. We have very many different types of, of producers, large scale, small scale, artisanal subsistence. And in addition to that, we have many different species. Just uh, in terms of a comparison, uh, there is an estimation that we have around, around 60, 60 to 100 species of, uh, of pork, uh, cattle, and, 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 and poultry combined that are trade internationally. And if you go for fisheries, 
we have more than a thousand species traded internationally. So there is a huge variety of species. And what we have in the COVID-19 is that we have like a pre-COVID-19 chain that was quite stable and the situation of the pandemic beat, brought uh, huge impacts on the interlinkages of those areas. So we do have impact on production, demand, logistics and transportation, processing and international trade. Effects on production. Uh, we have a huge change in international demand. We know the importance of hotel, restaurants, and cafes, what we call the Horeca se sector, in the demand for fish and fish products. And in the majority of the world, this sector was closed for a while. So we have seen a huge change in the demand for high value products. We have, the, we have seen restriction in the move of, movement of people with effects on crew going on board fishing vessels, on workers going to farming uh, areas of fish, on uh, workers going to processing units. Uh, we have the issue of human biosecurity in terms of uh, social distancing, even within production lines and factories. Uh, we have some, we have a temporary closure of some ports, problems with vessel supplies, coastal fisheries. In aquaculture, uh, the, the impact has caused a disruption in terms of the outputs and inputs. So we have an increase of the, of, of the, of the overflow of maintenance of the stocks in farming. Uh, problem with seed and feed supply, and also problem with movement of people in terms of working workers being able to go to the farmer farmings to to work. In terms of uh, the other areas uh, in the processing, we do have a reduction of the inputs. Uh, the movement of people that I mentioned before, in terms of having people not being able to get to factories. Minimal distribution, minimal distance between workers in the factories, reduce with the with the consequent reduction of production and distribution issues due to logistics. Uh, in terms of markets, we have seen a drastically reduction in the hotel, restaurants, and cafes demand. On, and on the other side, consumers start looking for products with long life shelf. Uh, so that was a very, so in terms of canned products, canned fish products, and also frozen products, we have seen an increase in demand for those products. Uh, we also have faced problem with timely transportation and border restrictions imposed by many countries. In terms of fisheries governance, uh, many governments have reduced the personnel in charge of monitoring and surveillance uh, in the fishery areas. And also, we, uh, so we have seen problems with uh, observers on board and also uh, the, the problem with IEU fishing during this period. Uh, in goldfish, I'm going to mention more about goldfish at the end of my presentation. But in Globefish, we have run a short questionnaire about uh, what are the perceived effects on the sector. The questionnaire was was responded was was answered by uh, by the industry uh, from different countries, from different uh, actors throughout the value chain. And what we see in this questionnaire is a clear a uh, perceived change in demand with a large decrease, regardless if you are in hospitality, wholesale, or retail. Uh, we have seen a, a, a large decrease in exports, 
But in terms of prices, uh, in terms of frozen or unprocessed, it's interesting to those, notice there is a large component of participants that have reported no change in prices for frozen or uh, unprocessed or even isolate decrease. So uh, this is a very important aspect, how, how the different perceptions also are associated with the, with the format of the product. And of course, we have faced, as I mentioned before, a huge increase on, uh, on frozen and processed products, but with no perceived price change on that. Uh, we have seen many adaptation and mitigation measures uh, throughout the globe. Uh, we have seen some countries start doing remote stock assessment in order to avoid people to go on the field. Uh, we have seen market diversion and diversification of products. For example, we have seen some uh, aquaculture producers in France uh, using Google Maps with uh, and putting in Google Maps their direct address with contact details so that consumers know that in their region there is a, an aquaculture producers that can offer direct sales. Uh, and also we have seen a proliferation of online training. And I think CIPTEC has done a lot of uh, uh, online training in this recent uh, period. Of course, we are we are already starting to assess some immediate effects of the pandemic in terms of uh, increasing the trade of more value products instead instead of volume. Uh, it's also interesting since we have the reduction of the supply to host to hotels, restaurants, and cafes. We have seen also some very high value products, fish products, being sold at the supermarkets for the first time. So instead of selling those products to restaurants, some of them, they have been diverted to supermarkets. We have seen also an, ex an increase of trade uh, with regional markets. Access and neighboring countries selling more between them, and also uh, many of the fish products that used to be exported now being focused on the domestic market. New shopping habits, of course, we all know that we have seen any, a dramatic increase of online sales, uh, but on the other hand due to all the problems in terms of uh, inputs, in terms of uh, workers, in terms of distribution, we have seen an increase in fish loss and waste. Uh, and also digitalization, which is quite natural, and the rearrangement of companies in terms between vertical and horizontal modes. Um, Many international organizations, and FAO is no exception for that, we have tried to uh, keep the sector as much informed as possible and to come up with policy briefs that can support countries and the sector as a whole. In this regard, we have uh, issued uh, a statement together with the World Trade Organization and the World Health Organization talking about the importance of open borders during these pandemic times. In addition to that, we have a specific policy brief on fisheries uh, that has been released about a month ago that can be downloaded using this QR code on the right. And what's the future? We do have a very, uh, I was planning to run some kiss, but during the short time, I prefer, I prefer to skip the kiss, sorry for that. Uh, we have a, a population that is increasing dramatically in the next years. So that's, that's the, the, official for, the official United Nations forecast for the population increase. And to, to, 
to increase, to, to feed this population increase. We have to feed them. We have to feed this, in, this population increase with food. And fish is one of the most uh, ad adequate food to, to fit this need. Why? Because of the impact on production in terms of sustainability, in terms of, and also the, how quick we can answer in terms of feed produ of, of production. So this, this table here shows a little bit the forecasts that we have for fish production and how the countries are going to perform in the next years. We are forecasting that aquaculture is going to continue to be one of the major important sup uh, fish supply and uh, aquaculture is, plenty, is, is expected to suppress uh, white capture in 2022. One important note, aquaculture already surpassed white capture if we only consider human consumption. But if you consider the production as a whole, it's good because also we have all the, the fish products that are used uh, to produce fish oil and fish meal. But if we exclude that, aquaculture already surpassed uh, white capture. But uh, aquaculture as a whole is going to surpass white capture around 2022. Uh, Asia is continued to be a very important region in the world for both production and consumption. Fish is going to be continue a highly tradable commodity, but with one major difference. The, the countries, the supplying countries are going to be more or less the same, but we are going to have more countries buying fish and fish products. So we're going to have a wider range of importing countries. I'm going to, to raise one particular aspect in FAO that uh, talking about the future, the future of post-pandemic, the future of producing more fish. We have to be very attentive. We have to be very careful about uh, some of the basic pillars about sustainability sustainability in environmental terms, in economic terms, and also in social terms. And I would like to raise attention for this instrument, this FAO instrument, which is this one here that's also downloadable at FAO website. And this instrument was uh, approved by countries, to, by all FAO countries, 25 years ago. And it was a very innovative instrument because it raises pillars throughout the fish value chain, addressing issues about sustainability, about uh, sustainability in terms of environment, in terms of economics, in terms of social, you know, in terms of international trade, uh, post-harvest issues, uh, fish production in general, addressing losses. So I'll encourage all of you to have a, a, a look at this document because it's quite comprehensive and it addresses every single step of the supply chain. In addition to that, we have some important instruments. And I would like just to talk about two of them that are becoming quite important of, of uh, exporting white capture fishers. One is the guidelines for catch documentation schemes because many important, mar important markets already require this uh, information. In the Port State Measure Agreement, which is an FAO agreement that for the first time, countries that signs for this, agree for, for this agreement are going to be able to block the unload of fish products imported in that country when there is a strong uh, evidence that that fishing vessel was engaged in IEU fishing, in illegal fishing. And also, of course, the SDGs. The SDGs is a very important issue. It's a, it's a business issue too. 
we are seeing many fishing companies starting to market their products using the SDGs, stating that they contribute to specific SDGs. That's a very important issue. It's not an issue from the UN, from the United Nations. It's not an issue from the, for the government, for a national government. It's, it's, a social, it's a value of the society. We have to be very pay very atten attention to that. And finally, one important aspect in terms of the pandemic is access to information. We have to be updated every single moment. Situation is changing very fast. And in fisheries, if we already had in the past huge gaps in terms of dissemination of information, now access to information is crucial. I just would like to raise about a website that we have in FAO called Globefish. When you have information about markets, about prices, we are the only, uh, we have a publication analyzing specifically prices in the, on the Chinese market. And in addition to that, those publications analyzes uh, information of trade uh, of some specific species, like tuna, salmon, uh, small pelagics, and shrimp. Each publication here is downloaded by the website. Uh, each publication of those on the trade statistics has more than 500 pages. So that's a lot of information, useful information. And, and also on the website, we do have an information about why importing countries are blocking fish and fish products at the border. What are the main region, reasons for rejecting fish products? Uh, so we have that for Canada, European Union, Japan, and the US. So again, uh, thank you again for CIFDEC for organizing that. Uh, I try to make this uh, a very, very wide presentation, touch upon several topics, trying to set the stage from uh, the following speakers today and tomorrow. And I would like to also to thank again uh, the all the participants, uh, my colleague, my, my colleagues, uh, future speakers. And I just to, to, to say again that FAO is completely available for information sharing, for dissemination of information for uh, uh, receiving any inputs, uh, feel, please feel free to contact me directly. Thank you again, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Marcio. Uh, I think we have uh, very entertained all of the audience on the news, I don't know, bad news or good news, but uh, Limot stock assessment to me sounds very interesting. Uh, thank you for your uh, comprehensive presentation, Marcio. I think we have yet, oh, I, I see one question on the, the panel of the question and answer. The, can, can I uh, give one question to you, Marcio? Uh, Sure, sure, please. The, there is one, one question raised uh, through email uh, communication yesterday to me, and uh, I would like to hear from you. What, what do you suggest in terms of the short-term or medium-term mitigation plan for those who are really hit hardly by the impact of the COVID-19? Because uh, in Asia, as you mentioned, we have a number of exporters, and uh, including importing. Uh, fish and fish products from many places. What, what do you suggest for the country who are the facing difficulty and hard time in exporting or importing uh, fish fishery products during these days? Any quick suggestion to them? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a very it's a very wide question too, but uh, uh, I think also uh, it depends on what part of, the, you know, on where in the, in, the, in the supply chain you are in terms of addressing those problems. But I'll say that uh, looking for alternative markets to compensate short-term changes in your demand can be a very interesting approach. We have seen that in many countries. Uh, when, I, when I highlighted the, the neighboring markets and national markets, 
was a very a very uh, a specific uh, issues that we have received as an input of trying to find alternatives when there is any possibility to export to traditional markets. But uh, on the other hand, what we have seen in the last one week and a half, which is not included in my, my presentation, is that many, bi the biggest importing markets are starting to import huge quantities again. Uh, we have basically summer period in the, in the Northern Hemisphere now, so there is a huge demand for fish and fish products uh, back. So we are seeing a huge demand of imports. Of course, uh, it's still concentrated on some, some type of products different from the past, but we are seeing some increase in, in, uh, in, in some, some specific demands by countries. Thank you. Okay, thank, thanks, uh, Marcio, for your quick uh, answer to that. I, I saw one interesting uh, question on the how, how the COVID-19 impact to SDG goals uh, 2020 this year. Uh, can, can you elaborate a little bit how COVID-19 impact to our target sustainable development goal 14? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting, a very interesting question. And of course, I, I, I saw that the question highlighted correctly that some of the, the, uh, the, the targets for the SDG 14 are going to mature this year. So there is a huge impact on the SDG 14. Uh, uh, the, the targets that are, some of the targets that are going to mature this year, uh, one of them, for example, fishery subsidies is not related directly to the COVID-19 because it's a WTO negotiation but because of COVID-19, uh, the ministerial negotiation that are, was supposed to approve the tax on fishery subsidies was postponed for next year. So we are going to see already an impact on, on fishery subsidies, for example, that's a SDG 14 deliverable for this year. In addition to that, the issue of sustainability of these stocks that contaminates more than one target of the SDG 14 is going to be hugely, hugely, is going to be affect, highly affected because of the problems that many countries faced in continuing the implementation of the of the stock assessment during the COVID nineteen times. Okay, thank you, uh, Monsieur. I think I think last question for this round on the as you mentioned about the remote stock assessment. Can you elaborate a bit on how, how we do that? for example? Yeah, of course, uh, this kind of remote assessment, is, it's, uh, it's some examples that are very capital intensive, uh, that we see some, some, uh, some uh, countries in the world that are using uh, very sophisticated kind of drones for targeting specific species and, and trying to assess uh, stocks using drone technology. So that's something that we have seen in some specific countries. Of course, it's not a spread technology, but uh, due to, but for to compensate, I think what happened in, in my, my personal assessment is that we had more or less what we had with uh, virtual events. Everything was more or less set in the past and the COVID-19 uh, created a, a speed up process to have virtual events. In the case of uh, remote monitoring uh, and remote stock assessment, uh, of course, those countries that implemented that very fast, they were already investing in that in the past. And maybe the COVID-19 is speed up the process of implementing those measures. Okay, thank you. I think for this round, uh, thank you uh, for, for this moment. We, have, we can come back to Marcio again at the end, at the discussion. Uh, for the all uh, speakers that we will do it in af in the session after the last presenter. Okay, thank you for the time being, Matthew, and we would like to move to the next presenter, Mr. Api. Uh, sorry if I pronounce your family name wrong. Uh, Kokana Singha. Okay, he's the representative from the uh, Infofish. He's a trade promotion officer 
of the info fish. He involved a lot in the monitoring and reviewing information on fishery trade, especially for Asia Pacific region. And he he also one of the person who collecting and analyzing the price and market, including information on specific fisheries products for the info fish trade news. If uh, you are familiar with that uh, magazine, you can have a look on his work. He also responsible uh, under InfoFish on the market trends and commodity update for InfoFish International magazine. So I would like to uh, welcome Mr. Api and his presentation. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, moderator, for the introduction. And uh, first of all, thank you, um, CFDAC, for extending the invitation uh, to uh, InfoFish to be part of this um, very important webinar. Um, a very good afternoon to all the participants that are listening in from whatever region that you are in. Um, my name is uh, Api, and I'm the Trade Promotion Officer at InfoFish. And, <coughs> and today I will be uh, providing um, an overview of the production, the current situation, uh, the trade and trends, impact of COVID-19 in relation with Southeast Asia. Um, it is important to, uh, to say here that um, InfoFish has been monitoring the situation in the um, Asia Pacific region and we have been um, providing up-to-date information as when required to our, um, to our member countries, to our partners and to our um, subscribers. For the benefit of those um, that are not familiar with InfoFish, we are, are an intergovernmental organization that, is that was established in 1981 uh, to provide marketing information and uh, technical advisory services to the fisheries industries in the um, Asia Pacific region and beyond. Um, we, have, we were uh, established to contribute in the development of our fisheries and aquaculture sector um, through the publication of marketing and uh, industry-related uh, information. So this information can all can you can always um, uh, sus subscribe to it on our bi-monthly InfoFish International magazines, as well as our fortnightly uh, InfoFish Trade News. Uh, we've also been regularly updating our. Um, our InfoFish websites with um, latest information on the impact of COVID-19 uh, in the region as well as beyond. I mean, we have also been um, sharing this uh, news onto our social media accounts. And for the past few months, we have been um, conducting webinars and podcasts on, um, on the impact of COVID-19. And you can always uh, subscribe and um, watch this in our InfoFish Org uh, YouTube channel. Uh, apart from that, we have also been uh, conducting training programs. We've also been doing workshops and seminars. And we've also been uh, conducting one of um, uh, many of our uh, commodity conferences. For example, is the tuna conferences that we were supposed to um, schedule it for this year, but we could not because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but we have confirmed to have the con tuna conference uh, in May next year. Uh, we've also been doing business to business meetings, um, but uh, for the past few weeks and months, we have been doing it online and we have been ex um, executing a variety of projects in the fields of uh, trading and marketing, processing aquaculture and fish. So, um, our office is based in Malaysia and we are part of, um, of a network comprising of about seven independent uh, intergovernmental and governmental organization, uh, including FAO Bluefish. Uh, and the purpose of this network is to uh, provide uh, trade in fishery products through their various activities. And also the, the one of the main um, uh, objective of this uh, network is to, is to share information on markets and prices and other statistical information from our different regions. So looking at the, um, the production side uh, globally, 
Asia and also the Southeast Asia region. Uh, as mentioned by Marcio, that global production, for global production, um, aquaculture has been uh, really uh, in increasing, uh, while um, capture production has remained stable. Um, looking at the uh, total fishery production for the last 20 years in Asia, it has already been uh, increasing uh, tremendously. Uh, and for Southeast Asia, uh, the production has uh, been increasing at a rate of 0.02%. Uh, but it is ex uh, anticipated that this the production in the Southeast Asia region is uh, projected to produce a quarter of the world's seafood by 2030. So this is a very important region in terms of uh, supply and uh, production and supply of fish. Um, looking at the um, global seafood uh, trade um, in the beginning of this year. So uh, the global seafood industry has been going through um, a hard time with, um, with the coronavirus infecting almost every country in the world. Um, the seafood, uh, the seafood uh, disruption trade between China and the exporters was one of the biggest impact of uh, the, the seafood trade. Uh, we, we expect that seafood uh, demand to be quite high in the beginning of the year because, uh, that, because that was during the Chinese New Year celebration. But you no, know, things have changed. And because of this virus, uh, the demand has changed. And for that, the Chinese government then took swift actions, placing uh, strict measures in cities. Uh, restaurants had to uh, close down uh, due to lockdown periods, um, international flights to and from China were, uh, were cancelled and this was not a very good news for most of the exporters to China. Uh, so for that case, they had to find alternative markets while others had to um, stop operation. So this was in the case of uh, mud crab in India where they had to cease operations because uh, the, the China market had to close down in the early period. Um, and also um, there was, uh, in the case of red rock lobster in Australia and New Zealand, um, salmons from Chile, Canada, and shrimps in Ecuador, and pangasius fish from uh, Vietnam. So China, uh, in the, China in the earlier period of, in the month of March, I think, um, they, they started to recover slowly and uh, based, they recovered slowly based on uh, low transmission cases and the emergence from their long period of lockdown. So the, the, restaurants, uh, the restaurants had to uh, gradually open up. Uh, however, the control web, mar web markets have started operations, but at a very slow pace as not many customers are coming to buy. So while China was recovering, um, the devastation was on the, the countries outside of China. So the two largest seafood market in the US and the EU, they were the ones that were infected and they were facing huge high losses in the seafood um, industry. Uh, and for that, with those losses, uh, they had to, uh, they had been an increase in the number of, uh, of people that had to lose their jobs. And, um, and then this had an effect on the production side. Um, also uh, the social distancing and the stay home advisory, uh, which is also one of the, the two of the factors that, were, that have led to the um, low production. So flexibility was an option uh, suggested by seafood businesses uh, to efficiently operate through this uh, crucial time. For instance, uh, in Europe, the Europe uh, Fish and Processors Association, they recommended that, that some relaxation on the import of procedures for um, seafood. So looking at the, um, the, the summary on the impact of COVID-19 in the global context, and I, I could say here that this is more similar to what the Southeast Asia region uh, would be facing as well. So looking at the summary in the global context, the, the links in the value chain system is just disrupted because of the, the pandemic. And this is affecting the, the actors 
in the value chain. Um, social distancing and lockdown measures have been the causes of low uh, seafood production. Um, and also, uh, there's been trade disruptions. Uh, there were cases where some countries had restricted imports and exports of, uh, of fish from major countries, which I will later explain in the presentation. Uh, there's also been changes in, um, there's also been imbalance in the seafood demand and supply. Um, seafood prices have uh, dropped and there's also been changes in our, our consumer preferences. Um, restaurant, the restaurant sectors have uh, in decreases in sales, while the retail sales have gone up because of um, uh, through, through supermarkets and e-commerce deliverables. Uh, there has been a low demand for uh, luxury, luxurious seafood products because um, these products are usually uh, consumed a lot in social gatherings, large gatherings. But since uh, the pandemic has, has stopped this, uh, there's been a low demand for uh, luxurious seafood products. Uh, there's also a strong demand for frozen and, and uh, shelf-stable seafood. For example, the, the canned seafood products, it, they are... Uh, they have been uh, flying off the shelves of supermarkets uh, in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, there's also uh, the impact on supplies diversification where consume, um, exporting countries had to diversify uh, their products. Uh, there's also been strong um, uh, impact on the domestic markets and of course um, the relaxation on the regulations. So looking at the international trade in the Southeast Asia, um, this is uh, export of fish and fishery products during quarter one of 2020 against the quarter one of 2019. Um, this is basically um, in, uh, data that is available for the, uh, for the countries that are listed. Uh, as you can see, as you can see that volume a lot of countries' volume, the increase in export volumes have been observed, while uh, the export values have decreased in a lot of countries. So to me, uh, it clearly tells me that the causes of this decrease in seafood value is because of the seafood prices have declined. Um, one particular story would be the Vietnam um, fishing industry where they witnessed a, a drop in the export value for quarter one because of the um, sharp decline in the price of pangasius. And also there have been cases where there's been cancellation of orders from major markets. So they, they, had, um, they have strived to, to increase the domestic market shares. For the case of, um, of Indonesia, um, there has been a restricted trade in China in the beginning of the year, but then um, the, the Indonesia fishery uh, exporters, they, they managed to, divers, to divert their shipments to Thailand, USA, and of course the EU, um, EU region. For Thailand, there has been marginal increases in volume, but the exports, uh, export volume values have dropped from most of the markets uh, due to the low prices of scanned seafood products. For Singapore, um, there's been decrease in the value of uh, exports due to the near to low import sources. Um, and for Malaysia, uh, they have reduced exports to Singapore due to the decreasing exports of um, giant sea buses, sea bus and snappers. Uh, for Philippines, um, there has been increase in export volume, but decreases in uh, export value received from major markets uh, in the Asia region, particularly China, Japan, and South Korea. Uh, we also uh, uh, received um, low export value from uh, the US in the, and the EU, market, EU markets. Looking at Myanmar, uh, there's been increase in exports to the neighboring countries, the Southeast Asia countries. Um, and this is uh, a very good, um, you know, a very good indication of uh, how they have been resilient to the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we also have Brunei that's been um, 
uh, that has uh, low decreases in exports of uh, fish and fishery products because of the heavy reliance on uh, oil to cater for the economy. There's also been, um, so, in, so in overall these, uh, uh, these increases of exports to the five major market, uh, to the four major markets except for um, Japan. Looking at the imports uh, during quarter one of 2020 against the quarter one of 2019, uh, I would say that there's been um, decreases in imports uh, in both for volume and value. Uh, this is because uh, this is because the the re heavily reliance on the own their own local production to to feed their own uh, locals for their own domestic market. Uh, there's also been decreases in demand from the seafood uh, restaurants and food service sectors in these countries, uh, which led to the decrease in imports. So, looking at the trends in the um, looking at the trends in the Southeast Asia region, uh, as I mentioned, some of the countries have restricted trade of fish and fishery products with the other countries. For instance, uh, in Cambodia. Um, they had to suspend fish exports around April to st uh, stabilize the domestic supply and, and strengthen food security for their own uh, people. Uh, and also they have, um, and, and now they have uh, managed to lift the ban on the exports and this is uh, helping partially offset the economic slowdown in services sector. The Indonesia has uh, temporarily restricted trade with uh, the China, especially on uh, live fish products around early February. Countries uh, had to divert shipment and uh, there's also been increased uh, exports to major markets such as the US and the EU uh, markets, the largest market for uh, shrimps and tuna products. There's also been a trend of um, the increase in exports of process, uh, ready to eat and canned seafood to these markets. Um, this is because there's been high demand of this in the retail level during the pandemic. Uh, so governments have set aside to support local fishermen, um, aquaculture farmers and seafood processors during this crisis. Um, looking at technology, uh, technology has been uh, helping tackling the pandemic related disruption in the Malaysia food, food uh, supply. So door to door sales of fish is becoming a new trend in Asia, particularly in Malaysia. The Fisheries Development Authority of Malaysia has been has introduced these door to door sales of fish, whereby consumers, uh, customers can place their orders through the, the National Fisheries Fishermen Association website, or the Shopee app, and uh, they can buy purchase their seafood and have their seafood delivered right to their doorsteps. Uh, the, the initiative is a result of the collaboration between the, um, the Fishery Authority of Malaysia and also the association. And according to the Fisheries Author uh, Authority, the huge demand for fe uh, fresh and frozen fish and fishery products will not be a problem as there is consist sufficient supply for all consumers during the movement restrictions that was in place. Uh, we've also uh, observed that there's been um, cancellation of international flights to and from the main airports of China, um, while they are opening slowly the, the domestic flights. Uh, people went into lockdown, um, people were working from home, but people still wanted to eat uh, fish and they still wanted to eat good food. Um, in terms of uh, Vietnam, Vietnam seafood exporters have, uh, have uh, seen their orders reduced due to the cancellation and postponement of orders. Um, Vietnam has also been able to gain export growth to some markets, uh, particularly Japan for shrimp in the first quarter following, followed by uh, US because of the high demand for shrimp during the COVID-19 pandemic. So in summary, um, the seafood supply chain is always has been disturbed. Uh, the links have already uh, have been uh, disturbed in such a way. For, 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 for example, the uh, transport restrictions 
um, that is affecting the supply chain. Uh, we also have um, shortage of labor, which has uh, disrupted the, the production side. It's also been increases in wholesale processes that are selling directly to consumers because their traditional cons customers, for instance, the restaurants are, are drying up. And also there's been an uh, increase on the sales through online and due to movement control measures, there's been an increase in the usage of, of online platforms for seafood buying. Uh, this is especially for fresh and frozen products. Um, consumer spending has dropped due to the closure of uh, seafood restaurants and the restrictions of uh, public gatherings. So what are we expecting? Uh, for for the next few months or the few years. It is likely that this trend is going to continue for the rest of the year. Um, overall consumption is uh, is going to decline due to, uh, to almost shut down restaurants and catering trade worldwide. There's also been shortages of raw material in the producing countries. There's also um, social distancing rules and other control measures that will continue to uh, hamper the processing and shipments of the existing import orders. There's also going to be in significant, uh, there's going to be uh, a, a lot of uh, increases in retail grocery sales and um, takeaway delivery. It is forecasted that the global rec uh, recession, the rising in unemployment and the fall in consumer disposable income, the demand for certain commodities will likely to be weakened significantly both in um, developed and developing markets. Uh, in terms of the demand uh, for retail consumer tax for frozen products will increase as dining out is unlikely to be the norm in the near future. Um, a lot of restaurants have been have restricted patrons to uh, enter the uh, restaurants so people would prefer to be um, to eat from or to buy from uh, supermarkets and cook at home. Um, and also there's been a rise in increases in purchases um, for, um, for mid-consumed countries. Uh, there's anticipation that there will be increase in seafood purchases in traditional mid-consumed countries where consumption of fish is uh, low. However, the domestic market has been expanding due to various factors and the demand for seafood is growing. So now with the COVID-19, it is more likely to see that there'll be a drastic increases in seafood purchases in these countries. Uh, in the view of the, vol for, um, the falling uh, GDP worldwide, consumer demand for essential commodities like shrimp will be more price sensitive compared to the previous years, even at low supplies. Uh, there's also going to be a spike in prices, especially for luxurious seafood. Um, there's also going to be uh, increases in organic seafood sales. Uh, this is uh, because um, customers, consumers nowadays, they are more particular to what, uh, what kind of food they eat. They are more conscious in, in terms of health-wise. So it's more likely that there is going to be increase in organic seafood sales. Um, of course, it's also going to be a growth in online seafood retail trade now that people are using online platforms for uh, buying fish and they've seen that it's more easier than going to uh, going directly to the markets so it's uh, they would uh, so I think that the trend for the next few months see a growth in uh, online seafood retail trade so thank you so much for the um, for listening to my presentation happy to answer any question Yes, uh, thank you Api, for your very uh, update information that we, we, we have this afternoon. And it's not happy to hear that the trend of the, 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 the things that happening after COVID uh, occur is trying to be, like, it's likely to be another long uh, until next year for another year. So. Uh, be prepared. I observe that we have a, a number of countries in the region having a problem, including, for example, export uh, Brunei, Singapore, Vietnam, and import, especially for Brunei. I have one quick question to Mr. Api. Uh, why 
uh, from the, the list of the question. Why India is not in the list of export country in, in your presentation? Okay, um, yeah, I, I think if I would have uh, India in the list to show, really show the, the, the trend. But I, I think we are just more focusing on the Southeast Asia countries. Okay, thank you. Yes, sorry. Uh, is that okay, Abi? I, I saw you just freeze. And then, uh, we have one one person uh, raising hands, Kun uh, Paula. I think we allow her to talk because just to change the at atmosphere for a while. Kun uh, Paula, good morning. If you're ready, okay, please. Yes, Kun Paulai, please. Please unmute your microphone. Yes, I, I think she, she's trying to speak, but anyway, so uh, can you, Mr. Api, uh, elaborate a bit more how you said the trend of demand and supply in fisheries and products are likely to to continue for another year. So if that case happened, for example, the countries that I mentioned earlier, uh, some of the countries including Singapore, Brunei, and Vietnam, uh, for example, Pancasius that we have a presenter tomorrow. Uh, what do you suggest? alternative markets as uh, Marcio suggested or what kind of the platform that ASEAN can some of the countries in ASEAN can can adjusting can adjust, adjust their own uh, strategy or, uh, yeah. or have a um, yeah um, yeah uh, as I was explaining um, these uh, these these um, traditional meat consuming countries like Pakistan um, they are, their seafood consumptions are, are starting to grow and grow. Uh, I think that some of these markets they can try to explore and try to look at into, um, yeah, and also um, maybe uh, increase the exports in the neighboring countries as well uh, because of the increasing in uh, people that have started to eat seafood nowadays. Um, also, there's been um, indication that, you know, um, the seafood, there's been uh, assumptions that uh, the, the, the coronavirus has been transmitted through seafood. Uh, but I think that that's for the, I think this was uh, just the recent news uh, that came in. Uh, but uh, I think that um, the, the testing that has been done has, uh, was, was later on, uh, later on showed that there was no, um, no uh, transmission between seafood and uh, the virus itself. Uh, so I think, but to answer your question, yeah, we can also look into other markets like the, um, the meat consuming countries like uh, Pakistan to uh, export these products. Okay, thank you. I think this round, uh, thank you, Abhi. And then we can have the final round on question and answer after the third or last presenter today. I think, thank you for time being, Abhi. And we, would like to hear the next presenter from Dr. Mike Philip. I think he, he was sitting here in this building before, the same building with the Safetech Secretariat. He's now current uh, director of the Aquaculture and Fishery Science with the World Fish Center and director of the CGR uh, research program on fish agri-food system. He, as I mentioned previously, he served as the program manager at the NACA, the network of aquaculture centers in Asia Pacific, where the activities are management of the organization of NACA in terms of aquaculture research and development program. I think uh, last but not least, we have a presenter from uh, our partner, uh, Dr. Mike uh, Philip from Wolfie Center. The floor is yours, please. Okay, thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Warowit, and thank you to our friends at CFTEC as Secretary General for the invitation to take part in this uh, really important uh, webinar. 
Uh, just checking, uh, Warawit, can you hear me okay? Yes, very good. All right, thank you. So I'll, I'll continue. Uh, so I, I'd like to talk and um, probably in a complimentary way to the earlier uh, presenters, uh, but again about the impact of COVID-19 on fish and aquatic food systems, really based on some of the experience of, of World Fish and our um, partners in, in the, the CGIR uh, network. I'll give a little bit of background first. Um, I should also mention that the presentation is with a colleague, um, Shakuntala Tilstead, who's a nutritionist, um, and Ben Belton, who's a scientist working on value, value chains, and they're um, leading a, a fair bit of the, the work of, of Will Fish on the COVID-19 uh, response. Now I'm going to just try and get the, the next, next slide. Okay. A little bit of background. So that the program that we're working on at the moment, the five-year program under the, um, the CGIR, which is an international agricultural research uh, network, and World Fish is the, uh, the center that focuses on, on fish and, and aquatic uh, foods. Um, this program basically uh, focuses on two major uh, pillars of, uh, of fish, fish supply and production. So looking at uh, ways of sustainably improving uh, aquaculture um, production and the supply of fish from, from aquaculture and looking at sustaining small scale fisheries. So there's a focus on, on smaller scale fisheries within the, within the program and raising the profile of the value of small scale fisheries and ways of better managing you know, that, that sector, both in terms of policy and, and, and practice. And then a strong emphasis on connecting the research work to, to impact. And now we have a very strong focus on trying to increase the impact of the um, work on, on fish to nutritional, uh, nutritional and, and health outcomes, as well as uh, income and employment and uh, environmental conditions. So we're principally a research for development organization, very much focused on connecting the research work to uh, the, um, the impacts uh, that, that we're all, all, all seeking. Um, we work fairly broadly um, across uh, Asia, uh, the Pacific, and, and, and Africa. And this just gives you a, a snapshot of what we call our focal and scaling countries. We have varied presence across these, uh, these, these, these countries, but uh, effectively the purpose is to, is to focus on a relatively limited number of countries um, for more in-depth engagement with partners, for research on local uh, conditions, and helping partners to develop in a sustainable way the aquaculture and fisheries uh, sectors. Increasingly, we're engaging with other partners and, and we're looking at not fish only, but the role of fish within food systems. So I'm just gonna put up a, a very complicated uh, diagram, lots and lots of arrows, but essentially, we're shifting the focus to understand more about the role of fish and aquatic products within food systems. And so whilst we continue to work on production systems, sustainable production systems from you know, farming and from the fisheries, we're also looking more at um, loss, uh, waste and loss. We're looking at the environment through which fish can contribute more to economic in, uh, development, to nutritional outcomes, and the way in which we can get fish into the diets of those that um, most need it. Well, within Southeast Asia, the consumption of fish is relatively high. There are parts of the world where it, it is very low, even though it's a, a preferred um, product, and there are great opportunities for increasing the consumption of fish for nutrition and health reasons. And the last speaker sort of touched on that briefly in, in thinking about how to replace some of the meat with fish 
in certain diets. And that, that's a great example of where we can perhaps integrate fish more effectively into the food system in ways that not only help the fisheries and aquaculture sector, but actually helps the health and nutrition of, of consumers. So we're trying to take a broader systems look at the role of fish within the broader food system and the way it can really contribute more to the future of our, our food system in a positive uh, way. Um, and coming to COVID, so, you know, having put that complicated diagram up about uh, the food system, you can imagine that it's extremely difficult to really understand all the interactions that are going on within the food system at this, this time. And we've heard from both, you know, speakers about some of the dimensions of that, uh, the impacts that are, that are taking, uh, taking place. We do know that, that though that COVID is, is um, precipitating what, what is called here a crisis within a crisis. So we have a health crisis and at the same time, the economic change, the value change, uh, chain changes that are taking place are causing a food and nutrition crisis for many of the, uh, the, the poorest uh, people on, on, our, on our planet. So, there are estimates that uh, 130 million or, or more now uh, could face acute hunger by the end of this year as a result of the pandemic, and that the global poverty will increase for the first time since 1990. So the, 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 the planet has been on a, on, a, on a trajectory of reduced poverty uh, and a, a positive you know, contribution to some of the SDGs we're now facing a situation where COVID-19 is starting to reverse some of the, the progress that, that's been made, and in some cases quite, quite, quite substantially. Um, if we look and dig deeper into the, the COVID, the types of impacts that uh, COVID-19 is, is having on, on the food system and the people involved in the in the food system. We know from the work of, of a number of the CGR centers that it's having greatest and strongest impacts on, on poorer people in society. It's also having significant impacts on labor intensive value chains. So that, that includes fisheries, uh, many agricultural value chains within uh, Southeast Asia and, and uh, the, the broader Asian region and Africa. And so it's not surprising that we can see with it across the, these regions, you know, quite, quite significant impacts on, on labor and the value chains that are very dependent on uh, large numbers of, of, of labor, such as in fisheries. And we also know that it has important agenda dimensions and, and uh, we know that in many value chains, um, both men and women are, 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 are active and often women in quite hidden, hidden roles. And, and so there are important gender dimensions to this uh, pandemic crisis that are, are important to bring to the surface and, and, uh, and, and, and address. At the same time, we know that uh, fish has a, a hidden, in many cases, but an increasingly recognized role in improving nutrition and health and part of a sustainable uh, diet and making it a critical component of a healthy diet, a healthy immune system, you know, at this particular time. So we have the challenge of ensuring that the value chains, market, food systems are associated with fish are active and delivering as far as possible and ensuring that the products that we work with are getting into the diets of those that essentially need it most. So Will Fish and, and some of our CGR partners, I'll, I'll touch on some of the, uh, the work that we've, uh, we've, we've been involved with. And, um, working in a, in, a, in a number of ways. Um, firstly, informally through, through networks to really understand in the, in the 
key focal countries that we we work what is the uh, what what is happening what are the um, implications for the, the the value chains both in aquaculture and fisheries and um, the sort of actions that may be taken to address those 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 challenges and i'll i'll flick the uh, the the website into the into the chat after this uh, this, this this talk and you can see that there there uh, we have monthly uh, updates across key countries on the status of the fish and aquatic food systems within the the key countries that you can see on on the on on the on the screen there and 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 hopefully that that'll be of use to uh, uh, you know a number of you in the in 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 the call. And they're updated fairly regularly, so really welcome both feedback on those and opportunity to um, to to improve and develop those in 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 in, in future. Um, we're also we have in an, a small number of countries a more detailed uh, look monitoring of the what's happening in the, in in the capture fisheries, and we're lucky in Timor Leste to be able to work with both government and um, fishery associations there and, and using remote sensing to look at some of the uh, changes in, in fishing effort um, throughout, throughout, the, throughout the crisis. And this is a, a graph prepared by, by colleagues of, of showing you know, fishing effort um, by month, different locations, um, across the, um, the Timor Leste, and and we have an, a couple of other countries where we're doing similar work and try to understand with with in country partners, you know, what what are the changes going on, what are the sort of responses that are useful to the uh, fishers and government to managing this challenging uh, challenging uh, time. We also have a fairly detailed using phone uh, survey uh, work in um, six countries uh, to interview on a regular basis the key value chain actors, both in, in fisheries and in um, aquaculture and in value chains. And you can see um, you know, some of the, the um, different value chains act actors there in the in, in the table. And uh, the data from that actually flows into an online, uh, on, on, online platform and that is available to, uh, to, to, to anyone to, to dig into, to understand the, um, the trends and to use that data in, 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 in their work. And I'll put that into the chat after this, uh, this, this talk as as, as, as well, and you can query the database in, in different, uh, diff, diff, different ways. Um, again, the intention is to, tr to um, firstly, to understand better the trends, and we can see already that there's quite a lot of variation between the countries, different stages in, the, in what's happening with um, markets, prices, um, volume sold, uh, and such other, other such uh, indicators, um, making it difficult to provide generic responses, but helpful within the country to provide and advise on more specific responses tailored to the, the country's uh, situation. And we, we have six uh, focal countries for, for this and, and, a, and a very open, interested to work with other partners who, who may be um, interested in expanding such surveys using standard methodologies to, to other, uh, other countries. Um, and this is the dashboard. So there, there's a dashboard here. You can see the, 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 the data. If, for those of you that uh, are quick on the, uh, the typing, you could type in the, uh, the, um, the address at the top and you'll be able to access uh, that, uh, that information. Um, whoops, sorry. Ah, there's, there we are. So that's a click through. No. Let me just close that. All right. Um, and then, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll move on from, from here. 
that's what happens if you're too uh, you've got too much technology you are trying to do too many things so i will uh just click forward and uh then <clears throat> try to summarize here some of the key uh, key key dimensions of the you know the, the sort of sort of findings and and i i guess we're saying something very similar of course to the the earlier speakers we can see um you know, impacts across the whole 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 system from production processing distribution markets and 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 con consumers uh, at various scales at various times um, depending on the on 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 the context, um, so for for aquaculture farmers, you know, constraints to um, inputs, um, and in some cases, starting to see those constraints leading through to lost opportunities to stock, um, and which will flow through to productivity loss. So we're starting to see, you know, some of the impacts, early impacts, now starting to flow through into production. Um, you know, reductions at, at farm levels in, in a number of countries. Of course, fishing restrictions we've talked about, market changes, changes to consumers, fish consumption uh, shifts, and, and um, because of the informal nature and often hidden nature of many of the value chains in the fishery sector, and particularly the small-scale fishery sector, we, we see quite significant uh, impacts on many people in that fisheries uh, value chains, but the implications um, yet to be seen in many cases in terms of the overall you know, development outcomes, but likely to be important. I'd also like to, to flag that um, the, the crisis also is exacerbated by inequalities so we see gen gender dimensions we see access to decision making um, by different uh, groups and our view is that to move well out of this pandemic there is a need to raise the profile of the inequalities associated with with the sector with the response to the um, to the COVID-19 pandemic and that involves media um, it involves getting data on both the role of women and men it does involve actively encouraging gender balance in decision making and considering safety nets that are inclusive as well as uh, ensuring that our research is um, it does also include gender and understanding of inclusiveness and the possibilities for empowerment of women within value chain. So strong dimension there in the research and the policy making that we're engaged with on gender and inequality. I'll talk a little bit more about the response uh, and, and some of the activities and directions for the responses uh, that we're involved with. Um, and this, these four points very much follow the CGIR um, approach. Um, one on food and market systems, looking at how value chains can be uh, effectively restarted and um, in work. Um, one focused on health, both understanding the, uh, the, the, the health dimensions of fish within the food system and ways in which fish can contribute positively to health and nutrition outcomes from this, this pandemic. A focus, as you were gathered from the last slide, on inclusive um, programs and then connecting research to, to policy and uh, in investment. I would say we're still at a fairly early stage in, in um, in exploring, supporting uh, responses to to the uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic, still trying to understand a, a rapidly changing um, situation um, in complex and diverse uh, systems. 
We have worked with a number of governments though to ensure that uh, aquaculture and fisheries are, and the value chains and value chain actors are seen as essential in government policies. And that, that's important in terms of keeping transport going for inputs, allowing fish to, to markets and allowing fish workers to be seen as, as essential, uh, essential workers. We've engaged with a number of marketing innovations and I see from the earlier dis, um, presentations also the role of direct marketing, digital uh, approaches have come through quite, quite strongly and, th and that's also clearly emerging from our, our work. And there's the, the bottom right hand picture is also from, from Malaysia where there are a number of um, really nice digital initiatives uh, I I emerging. And looking at other support mechanisms. So our team in Bangladesh are looking at how to improve access from commercial banks uh, to, 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 to farmers at this time when, when cash in the economy may and, and indeed is not uh, easily available to, to many. And I think there's an important role, role here for knowledge exchange and um, perhaps this, this could be flagged for discussion within within CFDEC um, to accelerate the uh, exchange of, of knowledge. There's so many different dimensions to what's, what's happening that the good knowledge exchange, looking at what policies have worked, what have not worked, um, looking at how you can support in country, farmer, fisher organizations to uh, respond well is an important direction, uh, I think for all of our, our work. Um, engaging around the One Health, less work initially in, the, in, in this area, but working closely with our colleagues in the livestock sector um, and, uh, and, and other partners to understand the role of fish within the, uh, the food system and making our food system a healthier and safe food system. And I think there are some emerging positive directions for for fish as a healthy product in our, in our food system that we can and should promote. Um, both in terms of raising awareness of the importance of, of fish, and we could see in the chat, there was a little bit of discussion about the negative uh, you know, impacts, risks associated with, with fish. In our experience, um, there are many, many positives to increasing the consumption and access to fish in terms of health and nutrition. And there's an important role for the, the sector to be very active in, in um, addressing and communicating that, that message. Um, food safety of workers and, and food products, some of the transitions that are taking place to the wet markets as a result of the um, concern, largely initially about um, animal uh, products. We have to make sure in that transition that uh, you know fish is properly looked after in in traditional markets. Access to fish is not 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 in, in excluded as a result of tighter restrictions on on markets that involve animals. So there's work to do in that space. Especially the fourth area, a third area around um, looking at vulnerable populations, and we've in, been involved in a number of uh, programs in India, in in particular about to, at this time keeping fish in school feeding programs, and and indeed providing through that the opportunity for businesses to sell fish to those those feeding programs. Um, ensuring that fish is in integrated within uh, different uh, social protection um, initiatives and public awareness programs. And, and the photo on the right actually comes from a, a member of parliament in Bangladesh who was uh, um, promoting healthy diets. And it was really good to see that he's got fish at the center of that, that, uh, that, that promotion. So, there's public awareness work to be doing at this time on the role of fish, the benefits of fish within healthy and nutritious diets. And also uh, we have quite a big team working on, on gender, um, both in, in integrating gender into research and policy development and, and looking at ways to support partners to put that, that, 
awareness of gender in, in, into action. Um, and finally, a little bit light here, but very uh, important area of, of, of work is, is connecting with governments in the, in the policy space and helping to provide good evidence for policy and, and investment solutions. And we work carefully um, in the state of Odisha, in India, um, with other partners in, in, in Bangladesh, and at the Committee on Food Security um, at, at a quite a high level to in, ensure that fish is recognized within the policy uh, that are being developed in response to this uh, initiative at various, uh, various levels. And finally, just a look to the, the, the future. Um, and I put on the right the, uh, the, the Myanmar um, government economic relief, relief plan, and not so much for the fisheries and aquaculture there, but the, the fact that some aspects of that are very much looking into the future. And it, that, it, that contains some very interesting priorities given to solar power and new areas of investment looking to the future and so part of the discussion and uh, increasing awareness and thinking around um, the the building back uh, back back better and some of you will remember that from earlier days uh, that some of the earlier challenges after natural di disasters you know, very much look for ways to build back uh, better and then I think uh, we're trying to support through our networks, our partners, you know, introducing practical and forward-looking thinking into the rebuilding that essentially is taking place during and after this COVID-19 pandemic. And on the left, you can see a, a, a framework that uh, recently released from the OECD, um, supply change, you know, zero greenhouse gas emissions, looking at climate resilience. And this, this crisis is making a lot of people think about beyond the pandemic, what about climate? Is that going to have such an impact? And how do we manage that? Um, and the role of behavior change, natural um, ecosystems and, and biodiversity. So I really encourage as we engage in this discussion as CFDEC, um, uh, and its members you think about the future, that there is also a discussion, a sharing of ideas on, on how we can support the sector, even though clearly there are many, many challenges at the moment and we have to be realistic and practical, but to think beyond you know, what can we actually do now that makes things better for the future. So with that, a big thank you again to the uh, to, to the organisers. Thanks very much. Really, real pleasure to uh, engage with with CFTEC again after a, a number of years. So, thank you, and uh, I'll close my talk there and obviously open for for questions now. Thanks very much. Surprisingly, on the view from. Uh, Dr. Mike Philip on gender dimension, which uh, has very much uh, giving us information on how the COVID-19 impact or hit to the, the gender dimension in terms of the, the male, female, and others. And I think well, there's a number of interesting questions here, but uh, can, can Dr. Mike, uh, can you elaborate a bit more how the food system is changing, I believe, the way of people eat or the way of people buy things. Uh, what kind of the, the first priority in your uh, relief plan that you, you, can, you can tell us? What kind of the most priority that in the food system or supply uh, of seafood in the world or in any uh, region can, what kind of relief plan that you recommend the first priority? That's a, <laughs> that's a very big, challenging question, Warawid. I mean, I, the role of uh, uh, World Fish as an organization is a research organization. So that, that is um, 
that that is really about connecting with partners both in in public private sector and um and and so civil society organizations to provide uh, evidence information that helps them respond i think our, our closest contacts at this time in in the the few countries where we're working are, are to governments and we have very close um connections and in in the policy development area so the research that's going on about the impacts and the uh, actions that may, may be taken are, are feeding into government policy the best example being bangladesh where we've we've looked at the effects of transport value chain lockdowns on the food system fish food system in bangladesh and and have made some some recommendations that that, uh, that that were largely taken taken up i mean in terms of the food system generally our, our direction and our belief is that the fish has a much bigger role in the food system than it currently has so in terms of an environmentally um, you know friendly product low carbon product there are a lot of pluses in terms of a healthy and nutritious product there's there are a, a, a lot of a lot of pluses and for an industry that's that in some cases is still growing or needs to grow to respond to the demand then in terms of jobs in terms of income there are a lot there are a lot of pluses so we're working with and, and with a number of, of sort of non-fish um, organizations within the CGR to, to try and place fish better into the into the into the food system and and indeed in some cases look at replacing some of the other uh, animal proteins that actually might be um, uh, you know better replaced with with fish and fish products so that's a sort of general direction um, and uh, you know the more specific direction that we're seeking to connect with policy in in some of the the, the key countries that 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 that, that we're working and I, I'd say it's fairly it's still relatively early things are, are are changing but some of the work that's been initiated initiated may may lead in the medium term you know to more substantive and uh, you know, precise um, you know recommendations it depends on that you know it, it, it we, we have to be practical um, and we have to get to that that um, that position anyway thank you thank and you yeah. Yeah, please. yes no that's it okay okay thank you uh, dr mike i think we we have uh, uh, time uh, until four uh, afternoon in in thailand and we have some interesting question i think i have i have seen the quick on one question from the question and answer on the international trade of seafood is decreasing. I think I would like to hear from Marcio. Can you confirm decreasing trend of international fish trade or seafood? Uh, is that occurring in the current situation of COVID pandemic? Uh, Marcio, are you still with us? Uh, yes, uh, indeed, uh, we have seen. Uh, uh, this trend of uh, decreasing international trade. Uh, I just posted at a chat uh, channel a link to Goldfish publications. We have just published the Goldfish highlights, which have some analysis on specific fish species. Uh, we include in the analysis of the impacts of COVID-19 by species. So I think that that's is more interesting. But in general, I would say that we have uh, observed this uh, downward trend in, in international trade. Uh, one, uh, maybe just uh, sorry for, for taking the floor to, to, to an additional issue, but uh, I have seen uh, during the, in the, the question and answer and also in the chat channel, a lot of questions about uh, and, and statements about the contamination uh, and how the consumers are dealing with this it's a psychological effect of possible contamination of seafood, etc. I think we have to be, uh, we as, as, as seafood operators, we have to be very uh, clear on that. There is no evidence that the virus is, is passed through any kind of animal protein, particular seafood. So uh, I think we have to be quite uh, energic 
on this regard uh, to our uh, buyers, to consumers, to the society in general, that uh, if there is problem, it's, it's going back to old problems of uh, food safety in general and how to preserve and how to sell products in wet markets, for example, as Michael mentioned too, in terms of maybe trying to redefine what's going to be the sale of fresh products in the future, not only fish, but other, other fresh products in the future. So I think that's an important message. We have to be very energetic on that, that, uh, that is, this is the issue that is not related to any, any animal proteins, including fish. Thank you. Sorry for taking more time. Thank you, Masio, for your information. I think I, I do agree that we, 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 of course, we have to take care of the sanitary and the seafood that we take, but be aware that we, we, we still have to have seafood in our dish. Uh, I think we, we come up to the last round, last but not least, I would like to, to give one more round to each of the speaker to, to say maybe some take home message if you wish. Okay, maybe we start from Mr. Api. Oh, okay. Um, um, yeah, just to iterate uh, what Ms. Masio said about um, safety, safety of seafood. Uh, yeah, because I think that was because of the rumors of the second wave that uh, occurred in Beijing uh, on the salmon uh, product. But um, I saw that there's a question regarding um, online uh, online platform, how uh, um, say, how are customers assured on the safety of seafood selling online um, in Malaysia, for example. But in Malaysia, um, you know, in the online platform, you always have the um, how uh, the sellers usually put how they how they uh, process their food as uh, products. For example, frozen frozen fish. So they would have that on the online platform where uh, consumers can see and determine if the, the product is safe to consume. Uh, we also have um, we also have the uh, authority of Malaysia that's been conducting this online platform. So having this, um, having them up there on the online uh, platform, uh, you can we can uh, assure us they can, uh, we can trust them to say that okay, the seafood is uh, safe. Uh, uh, for example, yeah, uh, and also we have the fishermen association that's been there to uh, ensure that the seafood is. Um, is uh, transported to the consumer at a, uh, a good uh, price and a good value and a safe uh, product. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think Mike, you have any uh, maybe take home message from World Fish Center? Any relief plan? No, <laughs> sorry. Thanks, Warawit. I think this is a really good initiative. I, I, um, the, the situation is, is very dynamic. I think there's a key role for CFTEC and obviously uh, my uh, old organization next door, NACA, to be really active in sharing uh, the ways the different countries um, are, are, are responding to the situation and to look at uh, you know, opportunities just to share um, ideas, ways of, of, of managing and making sure that information in knowledge sharing, you know, go, goes to the farmer associations, the fisher associations, um, to um, uh, and and is listening to such associations. So there's there's a there's a good strong role for networks at the, at this time to really understand and res, re, you know, res, respond well. And I think there are opportunities for building on the way that people have responded, such as the digital and and there are others to to look at uh, how we can do it better in the and support better in, 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 in the future. So I encourage uh, CFTEC to uh, you know, continue with this sort of initiative and um, you know, just, just share solutions, ideas, and, 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 and that will help people in, in managing what's a very complex and challenging uh, situation. So thanks very much for the invite. Really nice to, nice to engage. Thanks to the other speakers. I really enjoyed that as well.
that's it for me. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mike. And uh, last but not least, uh, Massimo from FAO headquarters. I think in Italy you have faced a bit uh, difficulties compared to Thailand. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. I just uh, just echoing the what Michael just mentioned in terms of uh, this issue about information sharing. I think uh, I, I I also insist that a lot because I think during during normal times access to information is important, but now it's even more important, and it's our role as institutions to provide as much information as possible, and as I, and that also it's it's the role of the sector to try to to uh, dismantle rumors that exist about fish contamination, this kind of rumor. So it's a, it's a, a joint effort that uh, I think uh, I, I can say that on behalf of the others, that all the sector can, co can count on all the, all the institutions that are here to support them in trying to spread much information, scientific information, and, and, and clear facts about how fish is important, how fish is nutritious, and there is nothing associated with contamination or things. Just to con congratulate again CIPTAC for the initiative, and I think it, we can, we, as, as, as Michael mentioned, should, we should continue with this, this pattern of events like that. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Matthew, and thanks to our speakers. I believe that the sharing information to all are very important especially during the difficulties in, in surviving under this condition of COVID-19 pandemic. I, I would like to, to inform, thanks uh, to all speakers for today. Uh, for your information, all our other webinar today and tomorrow will be forecast and replay again to our website. If, if audience are missing today or you wish to revisit our, our replay, the video that we record under this uh, webinar today and tomorrow you you are welcome to visit our safe website thanks uh, once again and tomorrow we have more very specific to the export exporters a champion in the region including a number of uh, fishery products including pancasius vietnam including shrimp uh, salmon and also the tsurimi raw materials from from asian region and hopefully we see all of you audience the attendee again tomorrow and thanks once again to all speakers you are very very nice to us and we're looking forward to hear the updates information to, to to all of us again thank you very much for joining us today see you tomorrow for those who are interested in our webinar for tomorrow the last day thank you very much uh, once again good afternoon good morning to Masio. Uh, bye bye for now okay bye bye Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye for now.